Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we are joined by Dr. Aaron Tamiyama, and we are speaking about atropine. Are your patients getting what they paid for? Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Aaron Tony Alvaro. We're going to be speaking about tropine. And this is just such a great topic. Aaron, it is great to have you on the Myopia Podcast. Tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, where you're practicing now. Sure. So I am a Southern California native. I, I went to UCLA for optom- sorry, UCLA for undergrad <laughs> and SCCO for optometry school. There you go. Uh, did a cornea contact lens residency at the University of Houston and then a master's as well as a PhD in uh, myopia management and then recently uh, joined the faculty at SCCO once again. Awesome. Well, it is awesome to have you. And we were talking today about a topic that I didn't know is as important as it is, and that is atropine concentrations. Um, so I've been prescribing atropine for, I don't know, seven, eight years. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at price and choosing kind of what pharmacy I'm going to have compound atropine for my patients, somewhat based on price. And come to find out, you've done some incredible work that is showing me that Maybe there's a difference when I prescribe one concentration of atropine from one pharmacy to another. How did this idea come up in your mind and where did this all come from? I thought they were all the same. Yeah, so um, my PhD advisor, Catherine Richdale, um, and I, we started looking into atropine um, mostly because we were building our myopia control clinic at the University of Houston and we needed to know, you know, where, where should we prescribe, you know, where should we recommend that our patients get this compounded atropine from? Um, Obviously you start with local pharmacies first, but, but, you know, when we went to different meetings and started talking to other people from other academic institutions, found out that there's kind of a wide variety of compounding pharmacies and a lot of them, you know, they may be across the country, but will still ship to, you know, your patients in your state. So um, that's kind of where the idea came from. And then along with um, Gary Novak and Mark Bolimore, we kind of put together this paper looking at a survey of different compounding pharmacies. Okay, so so leave it to the researchers to be like, we're not just going to pick one. We're going to look at what their processes are, how they go about it, what's the differences. I love that. I love the fact that you did that. So, excuse me, let's speak a little bit about atropine and um, how it should come and uh, how pharmacies, you know, kind of create atropine in a bottle that we would expect. First of all, um, one of the things I didn't know was about uh, atropine and its pH, right? That's, a, that's an important component of that. Tell us a little bit about the process and how, what we should expect from an atropine prescription. Yeah, so I learned a lot in this process as well. You know, there are a lot of different factors that go into compounding atropine. Firstly, you know, there's differences in how it's made. You could start with 1% um, FDA approved commercially available atropine and dilute it with different solutions or different products. Um, or you could start with a powdered atropine. And then it's variable as far as what what those dilution products are, you know, do we just use uh, BSS or do we use artificial tears or, you know, a variety of different products, Um, preserve, preservatives versus not preservatives, Um, even the bottle, like you were mentioning, uh, how it, how it should come, the bottle size varies. um, And that has a lot to do with the shelf life, right? How long it's going to last, um, you know, and, and the sterility, is it going to maintain its sterility over a course of time? Um, the other thing mm. you mentioned too was pH, right? Um, we know that 
atropine is more stable at a kind of a lower pH, but it it degrades and then could that could alter the pH. So Mark Bullimore always likes to say, if it doesn't sting when it's going in, then is it really working? Yeah. So I somewhat recently prescribed atropine to my nine-year-old daughter. And, um, you know, Mark has said that to me and we got it. And when we put it in her eye, I said, does it sting? And she said, no. And I was kind of like, <laughs> Oh, bummer, <laughs> right? So that, that was kind of the, the thing that I was worried about. And my patients haven't ever reported that it stings, but it maybe should sting a little bit, right? Right. And I think the other thing is kids are pretty adaptable. So, may, so maybe, maybe. Maybe, we're, maybe we're hyping it up. <laughs> maybe we right. should. Well, it's probably a low enough concentration. I should put it in my own eye and find out if it stings, right? Right, right, uh, yeah. So, so you looked at like, 19 or 20, 25 or 26. I read the study earlier today, but something around 25 different places, right? Yeah, I think we started off with a list of around 26, but not everyone um, shipped Answered to and, to yeah. us. Yeah, and so they they didn't want to answer all the questions. And so I think ultimately we have about 20 or almost 20 that that responded to our questions. Yeah, yeah, and you found out some somewhat interesting things about. Uh, uh, about the way that different uh, different places do it, um, you you found I think nineteen different states gave you answers. Twenty one of them answered all the items that you had given. Uh, bottle size was um, reported as five mLs for po most people for storage. Ten pharmacies recommended refrigeration. Um, that was only thirty eight percent. Uh, sixty-two percent stated room temperature was sufficient. So there's that's a pretty substantial difference right there, right? Right. Um, Sixty-five days uh, median beyond use state provided. So you probably shouldn't get a like a ninety-day supply, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Twelve pharmacies use commercially available one percent solution and then diluted it down. Uh, about 40% used powdered, and then some of them didn't let you know their proprietary information. Um, some of them used artificial tears, I think 42%. I'm, I'm reading here 23% added saline only. Um, and then uh, a quarter of them used more than one ingredient. Um, and then some of them said, it's a secret, we won't tell you. So this is a lot of variability. And this right. is a little concerning to me because it's it's really raised my eyebrows since you've published this. Thanks a lot. Uh, <laughs> that maybe we need to re be looking at this. And I know there's also a company that's out there that's you know putting putting atropine through the FDA. Mm -hmm. My thought was, well, why would I ever use them? You know, I can just go and get it commercially available. But maybe there's a reason why we should use some of these companies that are putting products through because we know what we're getting. How right, has right. this affected you? And um, did this make you choose more specifically what, uh, what pharmacy you're getting the products from? Yeah, I think it's, it's important. You know, this opened our eyes to one, the fact that there are a lot of different compounding pharmacies that make atropine many different ways. And the ultimate end product that they're shipping to the patient is, um, you know, can vary pretty dramatically. Um, I, you bring up a good point about the, the companies that are going through processes of getting FDA approval for a product. And the bright side or the upside to that is that we know that they have to uphold or, or you know, abide by the FDA regulations. And so we know mm -hmm. that that product is going to be, uh, there will be a lot more testing on that product versus um, the compounding products that we get. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't, I don't know that there is a, um, you know, a good answer, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. I, we, we bring forth a bunch of issues, um, but don't necessarily always have the answer to them, but we do have a wide variety here. And I yeah. think it's, so if you choose to work with a pharmacy, I think you should ask them a lot of pertinent questions. I think that's the take home is that, you know, yeah. you can choose whichever pharmacy you want, but you should probably ask 
you know, what, what am I getting or what are my patients getting? Because we don't, as optometrists, right, we don't even see this product. We per give them a prescription or in California, we send the prescription electronically and then um, the patient gets it delivered to them or picks it up. And so we never actually even see the product. So we need to ask a lot of questions about what our patients are getting. Yeah, and I know there were only certain things within the questionnaires and the data that you you evaluated, but asking the question and getting an answer doesn't necessarily tell me anything about what I should go with. Is there is is it more preferred to go with the, a diluted concentration, or did you guys find any information? And you can say no, we didn't. Of powder being better, is it better to refrigerate, or is it? better to keep it warm, right? Is is there anything right. that we know at this point? Right. Um, well, you've alluded to our uh, paper that hopefully will be coming out at some point. It's currently under review at a journal, but we did um, acquire atropine samples from different pharmacies and ran them through a battery of testing. And so hopefully we'll be able to share with you on the next podcast, um, the results from, from that study. Absolutely. We will certainly have you back for that to, to learn a little bit more. Um, I think the, uh, the key takeaway from this data that you have, you have come out with is that atropine is a, a big part. It, it accounts for about 25% of my myopia practice, either in combination or by itself. Um, and it's increasing because I tend to be somebody who uses atropine more aggressively as combo treatment. And I think we're seeing a little bit of a wave of that, right? As we know from Mark, he says every diopter matters and he's proven that time and time again. So if I see somebody that is really progressing that enters into my clinic, I tend to go after it with, with combo treatment as often as I can. And some people have been like, well, how do you know which one's working? And I'm like, I don't know which one's working for sure, but I want to do everything I can to slow it down. And some people have a little bit of a hard time with that. So that's, an, that's another topic, but I go at it very aggressively. And, and I tend to go with as high of a concentration as I can. And I think that your data, hearing that, uh, that some of these concentrations may not be as high as we thought they were, or they may not be as effective, tells me that higher concentrations might be better because it may be diluted once it finally gets to the patient in some ways, right? I may prescribe 0.5%, 0.05%, and they may actually only be getting 0.02 or 0.01. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so maybe that's a reason to, to start higher when we're compounding um, than going to the low and saying, well, we'll work our way up if the patient isn't showing some effectiveness. Does that, does that make sense with what you've learned in this process as well? Yeah, I think that's a fair statement to make. Um, we'll have more information you know, in the next paper as far as the stability and the concentration and you know, what the atropine degrades to um, and how long it lasts or how stable it is. But yeah, I think overall, if we start out with a product that's not 100% of what we think it is, then we're already starting, you know, at a deficiency, like you're saying. And so mm -hmm. maybe that does mean we start with a higher concentration of 0.05% perhaps instead of a 0.02% or something like that. Yeah, because we may not be getting what we're actually prescribing. Very right. interesting. This is, uh, this is fascinating. It's uh, always changing. I'm really grateful there's people that are asking questions that I didn't think to ask, and they're doing research like yourself, Erin. Um, it's awesome to have you on the podcast. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, and thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next time on the Myopia Podcast. For listeners of the Myopia Podcast, we invite you to register for the upcoming Ophthalmic Innovation Summit at SECO on March 1st in Atlanta. Join the leading ODs and industry executives to see carefully selected startup companies present therapies and development for glaucoma, dry eye, presbyopia, myopia, and retinal diseases. 
To register, visit www.ois.net and use promo code TMPODCAST to save $100. Don't miss out. Register to attend today. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia Podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 